Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have five stories. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Let's see if we can reach 500 likes on this one. I think if everyone dropped a like, we could do it. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated, as I post long form narrations just like this all of the time. Sit back, do whatever it is that you do to relax, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. The house at the end of Cedarwood never collected dust. Despite the owners having died over 50 years ago, the windows sparkled and the wood looked freshly oiled and maintained. The grass was trimmed, as were the bushes, and the lush garden was filled with rows of flowers of all kinds, which never showed a sign of withering. As a child, I thought it was the ghost of the mayor who originally owned the mansion and maintained it. However, Mom explained that it was something the townsfolk did out of respect. A sign of the bond that remained between the town and its former ruler, who had since passed. It's like dropping flowers at a gravestone, except for an entire house. Though odd, it was far from the top of the list of oddities Cedarwood seemed to have. Oh, John. Mrs. Hicks' voice was supposed to have projected across the beige, brick walls of the family-owned convenience store. However, any louder than that would have resulted in a fit of violent coughs and splots of blood coating the Mieger handkerchief she kept by her side. Turning my direction away from the house across the street and back to Mrs. Hicks, I gave her a pitying smile. Despite knowing how much she despised being looked down at, my parents were going to leave for a date, which meant that I would have the house to myself. With that knowledge, I grabbed a couple of bags of chips, some chocolate bars, and a bottle of soda. How are you doing? I asked as I placed the food atop the counter, feeling a moral obligation to check up on her. Her dimples deepened, but the look in her eyes was an answer enough. Don't you worry about me, dear. She wheezed, stopping herself right before another cough. If you stressed over every one of us who were sick, you'd have hair grayer than mine. I think it'd suit me. I smiled. And for the first time since I'd started visiting her, she laughed. That only resulted in her covering her mouth with the handkerchief and heaving. The town of Cedarwood has, for as long as I can remember, been suffering from an illness. Doctors have done their best to explain it saying it was a result of the pollution, or that this particular stretch of land was riddled with mold. However, even though most towns with a legend as ominous as this one would have become hollow shells of themselves, Cedarwood's population has kept a steady, healthy pace. The rare disappearance resulted in a family moving out to grieve, but that was the worst of it. Now don't go and let me stop you. If I know your mama, she won't take too kindly to waiting. Mrs. Hicks warned, waving me away with a handkerchief stained a deep red. Her face flared up once she realized how unseemly she appeared, rushing to throw the cloth in a plastic bag beneath the counter. Giving her a faint nod, I turned around to the exit, only to be stopped by a towering figure in blue. I yelped a sound I didn't want to admit escaping me, and scrambled backwards. Sheriff Rufus! I breathed a sigh of relief, stepping back as the mountain of a man stepped inside. The sheriff gave a booming laugh, taking his hat off and giving Mrs. Hicks a nod. His mustache curled with his lips, forming the smirk everyone at Cedarwood knew. Though an intimidating behemoth, You'll be hard-pressed to find anything truly afraid of him. Even the rare criminal would feel at ease being arrested by him. A pleasure as always, ma'am. Once he tilted his head back towards me, any semblance of professionalism faded. What's got you so jumpy, Johnny boy? You didn't steal anything, did you? Oh, he would never. Mrs. Hicks laughed. 
this time without the intrusion of her sickness. He's a sweet boy. He'd never break the law. Sure is. Sheriff Rufus' trademark grin faltered for a little, his expression taking on more of a serious note. Except for that one time I caught you sneaking out after ten. Mrs. Hicks gasped, the sound causing guilt to eat away at my insides. John, she scolded, hands resting at her sides. I just rubbed the back of my neck awkwardly, unable to look the two in the eye. Do you have a death wish or something? What about all the disappearances? Imagine how your parents would feel not being able to find their boy. Now, now, Mrs. Hicks. He's already been punished plenty enough. No need to add salt to the wound, the sheriff assured, placing a hand on her shoulder. Besides, he promised not to do it again. Right, John? Though it was a question, it would have been dumb to assume I could answer with anything but a yes, sir. Despite being gentle, Sheriff Rufus was still a force to be reckoned with, and the last thing I wanted was to get on his bad side. Anyways, the sheriff continued, turning to see what I was so enamored by. When he realized it was the previous mayor's house, his smile had all but disappeared. Head on home, John. Don't keep your folks waiting. I nodded, bidding the two goodbyes and stepping out. By the time I got back, it was already nearing eight. My parents scampered around the two-story house like rats, frantically putting on their suits. I watched from the window, eyebrow quirked up. Mom grabbed me by the chin with a little too much force, planting a half-hearted kiss on the side of my cheek, before rushing out. Dad, on the other hand, just slapped the back of my head. Don't you go wandering out. Stay here, watch TV, do whatever. He warned, pointing his finger at me, before disappearing in the distance, grabbing my mother's hand as he walked down the street. I gave him a salute like the one I see Sheriff Rufus give him when he's joking around. Once I couldn't make out their form anymore, I immediately went to text my friend. Hey, parents are out for the night. Wanna sneak out? Sarah's response came only a few seconds after mine. Yeah, mine too. What are you thinking? My place or yours? I actually have something different in mind. Kinda want to explore the mayor's old house. Nothing. I could see she read it, but I wasn't even met with the three dots to signify she was typing. I sat down on the couch, staring at the screen until finally a message popped up. What's wrong with you? If you're too chicken, that's fine by me. I can go by myself. I'm not scared. I just don't want my mom to kill me for sneaking out. Your parents will let you off with a slap. Mine will literally crucify me. Come on, I whined, not caring that she couldn't hear me. Just an hour. The place is probably locked, so we'll just check it out and leave after a couple minutes. I could practically hear the sigh she was undoubtedly releasing. Fine. If we get caught, I will blame it on you. I sent her an emoticon of a thumbs up, grinning, see you. I quickly changed into warmer clothes, as it was getting cold outside, and made sure I had a flashlight. I couldn't deny the butterflies in my stomach, and the slight shake in my hands. Sure, I had been out a few times, but never have I visited the house up close, on account of everyone warning me away. My phone buzzed and I jumped outside, not needing to open the message to know who it was from and what it contained. Sarah flinched at the suddenness of the door opening, only for her eyes to return to those piercing dark orbs, whose looks made you think she looked down at you like trash. Probably because she did. Hey, she said, the usual monotony to her voice. It was clear she didn't want to be there. I didn't blame her, though. You have a plan? Of course I... If the plan is walk in and hope we don't get killed, I'm going to beat you up. She interrupted, 
and the way she said it left no room for argument. Uh, well, I have no plan then. She let out an exasperated sigh. It's not like I'm actually expecting to get inside. I am. She snorted, leading the way. If I'm risking getting grounded for the rest of eternity, you bet I want the payout to be worth it. What? Do you want to find the mayor's treasure or something? I scoffed. No, I'm going to find evidence. Proof that something fishy is going on here. She answered, walking a little faster than usual. I stopped, her words catching me off guard. Sarah was never one to say what she really thought, so hearing her laying out her suspicions like that was jarring. Something isn't right here, John. This town? Eh, it's not normal. The disappearances, the sickness, the... She trailed off, looking around as if expecting someone to be following. Do you think someone is in on this or something? Not exactly. Maybe. I don't know. I jogged forward, closing the distance. She gained in my time, frozen to the ground. An uncomfortable silence accompanied our walk, only stopping once the lavish house was encroaching on the two of us. Seeing it up close, I'm starting to get second thoughts about all this. How about we head back? I'm not leaving, she stated, her chest suddenly puffing out confidently. The gates were less of a defensive measure and more of a suggestion, as they were barely taller than me. Still, the condition they were in was pristine, with not a hint of rust coating any of the many bars lining the house's width. With a shrug, I jumped, grabbing the top. A little grunt escaped me as I lifted myself, crossing the top and failing unceremoniously on the cement floor. Ow! I wheezed, rolling around. Okay, I'm good. Sarah rolled her eyes, only to fall even less gracefully than I did. Do you think somebody heard that? My question prompted a short silence, both of our ears searching for the faintest of footsteps. The quiet made room for the familiar ringing to pierce my ears. Then, I breathed. Probably not. Come on, let's get inside. Sarah took the initiative, leading the way. Her shoulders were tense, and I could see her fingers quivering. Though she hid it well, I knew she was as afraid as I was. Probably more so. I sighed before moving along, feeling a creeping sense of dread overtake me with each step I took. Ornate rails lined the path leading up to the front doors, which were made out of some sort of expensive exotic wood. I gently pressed a foot to top the first step, taking great care not to make the wood creak, an action that proved to be useless as Sarah stomped up the planks, not bothering to hide the noise. Dude, I chided, and she turned around to glare at me. If somebody were here, they would have heard the sound of you falling, not some footsteps. She huffed, rolling her eyes. I grumbled a response before returning my gaze to the white door. A golden doorknob, shined not but a day ago, mirrored my image, if a little distorted. As my fingers traced the engravings, I felt my stomach begin to churn, a mixture of anxiety and nausea. If you're too chicken, that's fine by me. She mocked, using my words against me. When she realized my apprehension wasn't born from cowardice, her smile faded. Well, it won't hurt to try the handle. It's obviously going to be locked, so might as well, right? Right, might as well. There was no way it would be open, even as I turned the knob and felt no obstructing force. A part of me still screamed that the door would not give way. However, that part of me died a swift death as the door opened with a slow, ominous creak. My heart stopped and Sarah's eyes widened in surprise. W what Are you serious? The mayor's house is just left wide open? She whispered. 
a scoff badly masking her shivering voice. They take so much time maintaining this thing, but they can't be bothered to lock it. She pushed me in once the door was open wide enough, and I instinctively raised my hand. The flashlight projected the beam of light, hitting the corner of the barren hallway. Not a single chair, carpet, or painting adorned the space. That was about what I was expecting. Empty but clean as a result of the constant maintenance. Well, we've basically broken every single law in this town. And all we got for it is the inside of a dusty hallway. Not exactly. I swiped a finger across the ground, and yet nothing covered it. It's not even dusty. This place is cleaned regularly. Great. I don't know what I was expecting. She hissed, eyebrows furrowing into her skull. I'm stupid for thinking this place would have anything to do with the disappearances. Hey, Sarah, don't beat yourself up. I gently patted her shoulder, recoiling as she took my hand away. Don't, she growled, stuffing her hands deep into her pockets and looking anywhere but my eyes. We should just... Her gaze eventually locked onto something, and I could see the cogs whirring inside of her. Can you point your flashlight behind you? Uh, yeah. I said turning around, the light revealing a door with stairs. Stairs that led down. A basement. I yelped, immediately covering my mouth with a hand. A basement. I repeated more quietly. Do you think... That's where all the answers are? She continued for me. Although her tone indicated she was finishing my words rather than agreeing with them. I was going to ask if the mayor's head is cryogenically frozen there Disney style, but sure, that's a good theory too. She gave me a look, and I chuckled awkwardly. Right, not the time. Not the time, she echoed, and I doubt it'll be any different from what we've seen already. Great, so just more empty rooms and dust. I scratched the back of my head, walking up to the door. As I gripped the fancy doorknob and pulled, I was met with a flight of stairs that descended beyond what the beam of light could reveal. So, uh, should we... Sarah answered my question by taking the lead and taking the first step down. She waited as if expecting for something to happen before continuing down. I took a deep breath, stealing myself, and followed. The descent was steep and long, and if it weren't for Sarah, I would have turned around the halfway point. The light finally found something to illuminate. A white marble floor that reflected the rays at me, indicating that it had been mopped not too long ago. My heart stopped, however, as I realized there was another source of light. It was faint and down a long hallway, where two doors sat at the end their handles made out of the same gold as the one on the front door. Her hand found mine, squeezing with a force I didn't know she possessed. She was scared and yet the will to press on was stronger. It could be a burglar or one of the people who cleaned the place. I tried to reason, and even the idea of meeting the latter didn't sit well with me. If they find us, we're going to get into so much trouble. That didn't stop you from hopping over the gate. She didn't bother to look over her shoulder, her words coming out like a reflex. With a pull, I stumbled closer and closer to the end of the hallway, until we were right outside the door. I leaned on the wall next to the entrance, analyzing the strange design adorning the metallic slabs. It was some sort of pattern, with the gold lining the black, creating an elaborate swirl. It was hypnotizing, and yet it sent a shiver down my spine. I had already dialed 911, my thumb hovering inches above the button, when I moved to look through the window. Calling it a room would have been a massive understatement. It was more akin to a dance hall, its length and width stretched to a distance outmatching the size of the original house it was built on. 
Brilliant, glistening chandeliers hung from the sprawling marble ceilings, looming over floors lined by a series of tables and chairs. Paintings, each depicting scenes of the most beautiful places imaginable, decorating the walls. Meals not yet released from their metal containers were placed neatly on top of the tables, steam rising from them, indicating that they were still fresh. It was, by all means, a party, one that should have contained music and the constant pitter-patter of dancing feet. There were people, at least a hundred finely dressed guests, all wearing masks depicting different fauna. Each of them stood facing the end of the room. Rarely, a glass of wine was perched on top of their palm, the crimson liquid threatening to spill over as their grip tightened. They were so still I would have confused them for mannequins, if not for the natural sway of the human body. Aside from the tables, the only other object in the room was the stage, which held the attention of each and every single one of the people present. There, a figure dressed in flowing white robes stood, arms raised above his head as if waiting for the final moments of a concert. The mask he wore depicted the face of a crow with an elongated beak that curved down. Beside him was the spindly form of a woman, whose body couldn't go a few seconds without shivering. Unlike the snow-white ceramic masks of the other partygoers, hers were tainted by splotches of green and cracks. She looked to the man beside her, who gave her a nod. I watched as the man made a show of speaking, arms outstretched in dramatic displays of grandeur. I thought that somehow the door was blocking all sound coming from the room, but the faint sounds of clothes rustling and the clacking of heels could be heard. It was quiet enough to make Sarah's inaudible whimpers the only thing I could hear. Finally, once the man was finished with his speech, he turned to the woman, extending a hand out. Hesitating for a moment, she took it, allowing him to lead her to a wooden tub. She put one foot in with the help of the man before the other went in. Gently, the man pressed down on her shoulders, forcing her on her knees, then all fours, then onto her stomach until her head was the only thing poking out. He gently stroked her hair, greasy, tangled strands and snaring his fingers before suddenly slamming her head down. She retaliated, and I saw an arm covered in a dripping red liquid fight back. However, her ailment did not allow her to do much. The man soon subdued her, placing her head back into the tub. The sloshing of the crimson fluid, which had desperately avoided calling blood, echoed through the cavernous room. Soon enough, her thrashing grew into pathetic twitches, then stillness. Something primal within screamed at me to run, witnessing something no mortal was meant to see. It forced my thumb forward, dialing 911 before I even knew what was happening. Though the grip fear had around my throat was ever tightening, I was brought comfort upon remembering who exactly the police were in this town. The moment they found out about this, they would bring justice, and it would be over. I kept taking momentary glances at the priest, who watched the tub with the same discipline the rest of the guests did. By the time I took a fifth glance, I realized the police hadn't picked up. Come on, I mumbled, frantically tapping the screen. It had to work. The cops had to get here because I sure didn't have a plan to stop these psychos. What's wrong? Did they not pick up? Sarah's voice broke me from my thoughts, and I quickly looked at her. Yeah, I think it's the reception. I stuttered, and the explanation clicked together. Since we were so far underground, it must have been messing with the signal. Let's go. We'll call them once we're outside. Sarah didn't dare say a word, merely nodding before walking. As we reared the corner of the staircase, 
we were stopped by a towering figure whose monstrous height rivaled the size of the hallway. His mask depicted a canine of some sort. The option of reasoning with them didn't even make it across my mind and I turned around, hoping there was something on the other side of the hallway. However, all that met me was a hand that wrapped around my throat, followed by yet another suited man, his mask that of a stag. Though Sarah was able to skid to a halt before he could grab her too, the giant man wrapped his arm around her neck. Please, no, no, Sarah pleaded, the tears streaming down her cheeks, evident despite the lack of light. My desperate cries died before they left my mouth. My apologies were reaching their destination. He didn't waste any time opening the door dragging the still-kicking body of Sarah inside, where everyone's attention was directed to us. I expected the figure to do the same with me, but all he did was hold me in that vice grip, looking toward the priest. Once I followed his gaze, I could feel my heart skip a beat. Next to the fly-masked man was the woman. Her body, caked in so much red, I assumed it was paint, rose from the tub. Chunks of something dropped over her shoulder and head, sluggishly sliding down her body before dropping into the liquid with a plop. She turned, facing Sarah, now able to keep herself as static as the rest of the guests. Her legs no longer shivered, and what were once ragged breaths were now deep inhales. John! Sarah choked out, extending an arm out. On instinct, I reached out to her, only to be reeled back in the familiar sensation of asphyxiation hitting me. I thought I was going to join Sarah, but as the stag masked man took the first step up the stairs, I realized something was wrong. I attempted to keep up with his steps, but the lack of oxygen made me lightheaded, and I found myself tripping over every other step. I tried on several occasions to break free of his grip, but after a while, I realized it wasn't even necessary. Once we made it out, he tossed my body out the door, causing me to stumble and fall onto the gravel path, the sound of a slamming door making itself known behind me. My lungs greedily took in the air as the ringing in my ear subsided. I considered passing out right then and there, but the thought of Sarah forced my eyelids open. I dialed the police again, and again, and again, but the call never made it through. It wasn't a matter of connection this time, I knew for sure. That meant I couldn't rely on the police if I wanted to save Sarah. If. Though I stood up, and a small part of me wanted to charge in and save her, it was easily outmatched by the other part. I took a step back, imagining endless possibilities of what could happen to Sarah, and each one was worse than the last. I took another step back, thoughts of being next flashing in my mind. Finally, after the third, I turned tail and ran, never looking back. Though it was late, not a single car passed, and the roads and streets were empty. The only noise accompanying me was the sound of my heartbeat, beating so loudly I was sure anyone could hear. I returned home without so much as an issue, but that didn't do anything to quell the uneasiness bubbling in my stomach. They would find out. I don't know who they were, but I knew they would. Maybe it would be Sarah confessing that she went here with me, the stag-masked man who threw me out or the police who managed to trace my calls back to me. I wasn't sure how many of the townsfolk were in on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if the entire population knew about the party. It sickened me that these were thoughts that plagued my mind rather than concern for Sarah, but I didn't care if I was being a coward. My survival remained my top priority. I couldn't sleep. Throughout the night, I had the sensation that someone was watching me, but every time I opened my eyes, all I saw were the familiar walls of my room. The next morning, my parents awoke me with news I was more than aware of. Sarah had gone missing.
My mom was on the verge of tears, leaving dad to explain the situation. It was the same set of circumstances that followed her sister's disappearance. The police will find her, John. There's nothing to worry about. As if his wavering voice didn't deter my faith, though, I was brought back to the image of the giant looming man that grabbed Sarah, and I immediately thought of the police. I hope so, was all I could muster before leaving the room. A walk would get my mind off of things, I thought, and I naturally ended up at Mrs. Hicks' convenience store. I didn't stay for long, however. Though her toothy grin was plastered over her face as usual, something was missing. The uncontrollable shivers that shook her body were non-existent. In fact, she never looked healthier. She couldn't even get a word out before I sprinted outside, bumping into Sheriff Rufus as I did. He gave me a wave, but my paranoia-infested mind only conjured the most malicious of intentions for him. They were going to get me, I thought. It was something that entered my mind every waking moment of my life. My declining mental state was explained by the loss of Sarah, and I suppose her disappearance had something to do with it, but no one knew what actually happened. Or worse yet, they knew all too well. Though every attempt at leaving this town was met with heavy protests by the others, my parents eventually couldn't handle seeing me in this state and agreed to move. The change in scenery did, admittedly, help. I didn't have to see that cursed house in my peripherals every time I left for school, and I didn't have to smile at those who I knew for certain who participated in whatever happened that night. But, like most things, the relief was only temporary, and it became apparent why the idea of leaving seemed so foreign to Cedarwood. Mom was the first to fall to the sickness. Her coughing fits were the first sign, and before we knew it, she was bedridden, with her skin becoming paler by the day. Dad didn't waste a moment to get her treatment, but nothing the doctors prescribed her worked. The best we got from them were apologies, and that they were stumped. By the time Mom was too far gone, Dad was next in line. Like the stubborn man he was, he continued working for money. That is, until he collapsed. Once he regained consciousness, he requested for me to visit him. You... He wheezed, gripping my shirt with all the strength his frail muscles could muster up. Need to return to that town. I beg of you, stay in it. They will help you. I was about to protest, but the look in his eye was too much. I've already packed your stuff, John. Please. I can't bear knowing that I let you die. His hand dropped to the side by the time he finished, the only movement coming from him being the subtle expansion of his chest. Returning home, I found that my luggage was packed. Once the initial shock that he was able to prepare it in such little time faded, I approached it cautiously, pulling the zipper back bit by bit. Inside was every essential I needed. Clothes, toiletries, money, and my laptop. And atop them all was a mask. A mask of a stag. There used to be an old butcher shop down the street from my grandparents' house. It was about a few houses down, but it was unmistakable. An old concrete building, adorned with old logos for Pepsi, Coke, and blurbs about the special meats they had on sale. Ribeyes for $9. Strip steaks for only $12. All emboldened in a tacky comic font that harkened back to a time long ago. I only ever had been in the building a few times, but I can remember some details of the interior. It had an old country store vibe, shelves filled with old candies and other assortments, various canned goods, and breads from different brands. But if you went into this store, you primarily came for the cheap cold cuts. 
and I instinctively remember this big metal meat freezer right next to the counter. It scared me a little as a kid thinking what could end up being in there. The shop was owned by an old butcher and his wife. They were a sweet old couple, the kind you'd see going to church every Sunday. They both wore glasses and the butcher always had his apron on ready to go. I can't remember a time when the old man didn't have it on. He was always behind that counter every single day. If it were Sunday, he'd open at 1, and he'd always close the store at 5. His wife was the cashier. She'd sit up at the counter taking the money, while he was always cutting and tenderizing behind the meat counter. They were open for quite some time. Locals considered it a hidden gem when it came to getting delicious meats for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Then one day in 2011, the shop closed. I remember the day I found out. I was going with my grandfather to the shop. He had wanted to make steaks that day, and the butcher's shop was where he would normally get his cuts from. He went in his old pickup down the street, hopped out onto the old gravel parking lot, and walked up to the door. On the door was a chain lock and a sign. Sorry, we're closed. That was strange considering that it was 2.30 when we arrived. They were never closed that early. Disappointed, my grandfather told me to hop back in the truck and we went to the supermarket down the road from the neighborhood. Over time, more and more people came by the store to check if it was open to no avail. The sign remained in the same position that we saw it the day we went. It was disappointing to everyone in the neighborhood considering the only place anyone could find cheap cold cuts was closed seemingly indefinitely. And what was even stranger than the fact that the couple closed the shop abruptly was the fact that no one seemed to have seen the couple after that. They stopped showing up to church, you'd never see them come out of their house, which coincidentally was right next to the store itself. Some rumored them to have died, yet nothing close to their names ever appeared in the paper in the obituary section. No one knew if they had any other family, so no one thought to do a wellness check. It's like they had vanished off the face of the earth. Over time, everyone seemed to have forgotten the place. Sure, you could see the store while passing by on the street, or catch a glimpse when you drove by, but there was no sign of activity inside or outside the store. The old signs gradually faded out over the years due to weather and other factors. There were always rumblings of some real estate company or local business owner wanting to buy the building, but nothing ever came of it. So like many old buildings in our town, it became a nostalgic reminder of a time gone by. That is, until one summer a few years back. You see, like many old buildings in the area, Graffiti artists started to use the building as a place of practice for their art, much to the chagrin of the locals who preferred the building stay stuck in its time. So out of respect for the old couple and their legacy, local community organizers would come and repaint the walls from time to time. It wasn't a lot of work at first, but then the tags started to appear more frequently. I can even remember some of the ones that were found on the side of the building. JJ, Robo, Hellspawn. That one always stuck out to me. The place was always considered to be a simple, peaceful little grocery store, so for it to have such a phrase tagged onto it was ironic. Due to the frequency of the vandalism, they decided to have some members of the neighborhood form a watch to help stave off any potential vandals. I was one of the volunteers who would paint the walls since I was on break from school and staying with my grandparents. The routine we had going was this. At night the watch would patrol the area, while the rest of us came to clean up any mess during the day. It worked for a few days, but towards the end of the week, some of our night members started to not show up. We tried calling their houses to no avail. So eventually we just circled to clean up whatever mess happened overnight and called it good. Then we started noticing the smell. 
It wasn't as pungent at first, but then throughout the summer, it got worse by the day. We tried tracking the source of the smell, but found absolutely nothing indicating that it was occurring outside. Then one of the volunteers suggested maybe the smell was occurring inside the building. None of us truly wanted to go inside since it was an old building and God only knew what was rotting inside there. It was an old butcher block after all, but we decided that it might take some time for the sanitation department to come out, and if the smell got stronger, the neighbors would complain. So we bucked up and broke in. It wasn't too hard since one of the more handy volunteers had some bolt cutters in their truck. So we snapped the chain lock and headed inside. Oh yeah, it's definitely in here. One of the guys shouted. The first thing that seemed off to us was that the place looked like a tornado had gone through it. Shelves once neatly organized and labeled were all over the place with cans and various other assortments adorning the now yellowed and dirtied floor. The meat counter was empty, and the smell in the air was almost unbearable. The freezer next to the door was bolted shut. The lock itself was strangely new, almost like it was bought yesterday. I noticed that there was a door that was open ajar near the counter. I figured it might have been an office of some kind, so I opened it cautiously and saw an old metal desk with what looked to be an old CRT and a VHS player on top of it. This must have been the security system, I thought, considering the old couple were not the most tech savvy people in the community. It made sense that their security system still ran on tape. I figured that maybe the tapes would shed some light on what happened to them. So while the others were exploring the store, I sat down and tried to get the security system to turn on. It took a few tries, but after some finagling, I heard the distinct sound of static coming to life and was greeted by a blank picture. VHS tapes littered the table, each with a label denoting the day of filming. I took a look at each one until one caught my eye. 6-3-11 this was the day before the store closed. I popped the tape into the player and hit play. June 3rd, 2011, 5 p.m. The video showed a few different angles of the store. One view was of the checkout counter, two of the aisles of the store, and then the last of the meat counter and freezer. The old man sat behind his counter, working on cutting some ribs down to wash. The wife was busy tallying up the money they had received from the business day. It looked like a completely normal day for the two. That was until I noticed the meat freezer slowly opening. I wasn't the only one who noticed, as in the video, the old man had stepped out and saw the same. He slowly walked towards the door and opened it. What happened next is hard to describe. He starts to yell apparently frightened at what he sees. This then alerts his wife, who runs out from behind the cash register towards the door of the fridge. Once she reaches the door where her husband is standing, she looks as well and joins in on the screaming. They both are screaming so loud that the audio, already garbled by the age of the equipment, starts to clip. I watch as on the screen, the old couple gets engulfed by something. I could tell it wasn't human, nor was it an animal. It looked almost like it could have been a smudge on the screen. They continued to scream as whatever the thing was pulled them into the darkness of the meat freezer, and once pulled in, the door slammed shut. My face went pale. The scene was quiet for about 10 minutes, then the door opened again and a mass of long black tendrils shot across the floor, knocking over the shelves. One shot over the meat counter, and wrapped around the butcher knife the old man was using to cut the ribs. Then the tendrils receded into the freezer. All the while, horrified screams could be heard from the darkness. I fast-forwarded the tape, hoping to catch another glimpse of whatever creature that was inside the freezer. But after that moment, there were no sounds, no screams, nothing at all. 
Then I heard the clink of chains being dropped to the floor. I bolted out of the office, screaming at the others, Don't open the door! But it was too late. The door slowly crept open, but no creature emerged. But that smell... It smelled like the stench of death. On the floor, partially illuminated by the sunlight creeping in, were several boxes of old beef, chicken, and pork. All moldy from the passage of time. Flies and other insects buzzed about. But that wasn't even the worst thing we found. One of the volunteers shined a flashlight inside the freezer. The walls were caked in blood. I wasn't sure if it was human, animal, or something else. Hanging from the meat hooks were different bags, each filled with processed and tenderized corpses. Human corpses. And three were fresh. We bolted out of the building and immediately called 911 and screamed for the cops to come. In the end, seven different bodies were carried out of the butcher shop that day. They were identified as the owners of the store, while the other five were volunteers from the night watch. The store was demolished shortly after that, and a candlelight vigil was held for the lives that were lost. I was never the same after seeing that tape, knowing that I was the only one who saw what happened to those two, and knowing that what happened to them likely happened to our volunteers. I didn't go to my grandparents for some time after that, until they eventually moved away from that neighborhood. After some years of consultation with therapists, I ended up returning to that neighborhood recently. I met up with one of the neighborhood kids who had been a playmate of mine. Trauma never really goes away, and you can kind of see that when you drive through the neighborhood now. Most of the houses close to the site of the tragedy are now abandoned, although there are still some, like my old buddy, who still call it their home. I asked him about the demolition, and how the community felt when the place finally came down. He took a little bit of time to think before he answered. You know, it's really weird, he explained. They bulldozed the place quickly after word got around about what happened. Before they did though, the police checked the place one last time, for whatever reason. They found wrapped cold cuts sitting on the meat counter. He paused for a moment. They were fresh. I didn't believe it when my older brother claimed he had won the lottery. $450,000 after taxes. We grew up in a fairly low class family. There were five of us. My parents, a couple that had never gotten married to begin with. My older brother Frankie, 32 male. And there was my sister Cam, 27 female. And then me, the baby of the family, 26 male. Our parents did their best to keep us with a roof over our heads and food in our bellies. Financially and emotionally, our childhood was a struggle for sure, but we always managed to just scrape by. The point being, to us, that was a lot of money. Life-changing. And my brother was no Scrooge either. He was already making plenty of money as the chief of police in our small New Jersey town, so he made it a point to spoil my sister and I with the winnings. I remember when he handed me the keys to my new truck just three months ago. I had insisted that it was too much, that I couldn't possibly take it. He only laughed and shoved the keys into my hand. Just make sure you get rid of that hunk of junk you're driving now, he told me. Things not safe. Not only did he shell out for a new car for our sister, but he even paid for her wedding to our brother-in-law Kyle, 28 male. A few years back, we had cut ties with our parents who were now happily divorced. So they said, their animosity towards each other, felt poisonous after years of a miserable marriage. So, we had made it a point to just stick together. Just the three of us with the addition of our brother-in-law, of course, and my longtime girlfriend, Amelia, 
26 female. But the one thing my brother bought himself with his lotto winnings was a small cabin deep in the Pine Barrens. As somewhat of a novice camper myself, I couldn't wait to get the call to pack up and spend the weekend. And last month, the call finally came. Everyone took off that Friday, and we met Cam and Kyle at a nearby convenience store so they could follow us up to the cabin where we would end up spending the next long weekend. Frankie had warned us that we couldn't exactly find the cabin via GPS, and since I was better with directions, it just seemed easier. His instructions took us down this long dirt road for about a good 20 minutes. The trees crowded the road as if they were being used as a barrier to keep people out of the woods. This has to be the scariest place at night, Amelia whispered. Yeah, I agreed. Probably best if we don't wander too far from the cabin. And almost as if it were queued up, the road opened to a large clearing that revealed the cabin. Looking at its size, however, it seemed like more of a lodge. Judging from the deck above the porch, it was safe to say that it was two stories. It had a long wrap-around porch and big, beautiful windows. Nearby, there was a large deck that led out to what appeared to be a private lake. We pulled up next to Frankie's jeep and admired the cabin. Man, he must have really splurged on this. Kyle commented. I rolled my eyes. Recalling a distasteful indication from Kyle a few weeks ago that our brother should have bought him and Cam a house with his money. It's amazing. Cam commented as she grabbed her bags from the back seat. Suddenly, the door flung open, and Frankie bounded down at the steps. You made it, he exclaimed. He came down and gave me and my sister a hug gave Amelia and Kyle the courteous greetings a brother-in-law would usually make, and stood with a huge grin on his face. You find it okay? He asked. It was hard to get lost with all the trees, I replied. These woods are dense. He merely laughed. Yeah, it's pretty nice, isn't it? He asked. Finally, some safety and privacy. He chuckled as if he didn't get that at his main house that was nestled in town. He almost seemed like he couldn't believe his luck. Well, come on in. I'll give you the tour. He waved us inside and we all bound up the steps into the large living room of the lodge. It had a nice stone fireplace, a big screen TV, two couches that might as well have been beds, and a chair that looked like it could swallow you whole. Hanging on the walls of the cabin were family photos as well as some pop culture posters, which knowing my brother was to be expected. There was also two bookshelves filled with old paperbacks and graphic novels, and an extra large DVD case filled top to bottom with all the hits. Frankie insisted on physical media just in case he wanted to watch something that wasn't on streaming, and admittedly, it's satisfied a craving or two. Let me show you to your rooms. Frankie waved us on past an immaculate kitchen and down a large hallway. At the end of the hallway was a staircase, but just before it was two doors. One on the left and one on the right. He opened the door to the left to reveal a bathroom, explaining that the cabin of course had electricity and plumbing. But he glossed over the door to the right and just went upstairs. What's in here? I asked as I reached for the door to the right. I tried to turn it, but it didn't budge. Basement, Frankie replied bluntly. Best to just stay out of there. You got something locked down there? Cam asked jokingly. I've been using it as an office, Frankie explained. It's got sensitive files in there, so it puts my mind at ease to have it locked at all times. He waved us upstairs to show us where we would be spending the weekend. There was a door right at the top of the steps to the right. To the left there was a large open area with a pool table nestled in the center which immediately called out to me. He opened one of the doors to reveal another bathroom and then two identical doors that were next to each other. These are the guest rooms, 
Frankie told us. I took the room closest to the bathroom and admired the view. It was a large bedroom that was already equipped with dressers, a king-sized bed, two nightstands, and a small chair that sat next to a sliding glass door. I tossed mine and Amelia's bags on the bed and walked out the sliding glass door onto a deck. This one apparently overlooked the backyard which was graciously equipped with a small net for volleyball and badminton, as well as a large gravel area containing a fire pit, picnic table, and a few chairs. It also gave me a good idea at just how isolated we were here. The clearing of the property had to be maybe two or three acres. After that it was more dense woods north and west of the lodge. I took a look east and got a nice view of the sun glistening off the lake. I snuck across the deck and got a view of my sister's room which was identical to mine. I shrugged and came back inside the room where Amelia was putting all our stuff in the wardrobe. Want some help? I asked. Do I want you to just shove everything in one drawer? She laughed. No, I got it. I shrugged and rejoined my brother in the large open space. He was clearly stuck in conversation with Kyle. Some kind of get-rich-quick scheme he wanted him to finance. What's that room? I asked, pointing to the room by the top of the stairs. My room, Frankie replied. He seized his moment to exit the conversation and took us over. The room looked exactly like ours. I thought he would have gotten more extravagant furniture in his own room. But then again, my brother was a simple man. The only notable difference was that the walls weren't bare, but littered with more family photos as well as newspaper articles highlighting his career. He had a knack for finding evidence that gave slam dunk convictions. One of the traits that led him to becoming the youngest chief of police in our small town's history at the age of only 32. But the one thing that caught my attention was a mirror that hung over his dresser directly across from his bed. On it was this old white sticker that was about the size of a bookmark. It had an old school yellow smiley face on it and read, Smile, you have your whole life ahead of you. I chuckled and pointed out the sticker. Came with the house, Frankie explained. He ushered me out of his room and closed the door behind him. I'll let everyone get settled and then come on down for lunch. I'll be outside. Feel free to grab your swimsuits and hit the lake. I gave him a firm thumbs up as he departed down the steps. I peeked into the room to see Amelia had finished unpacking, so I snuck over to the pool table for some free shooting. Once I sunk all nine balls, Amelia and I joined my brother downstairs. Kyle and Cam followed shortly after. We met Frankie outside where he was grilling up some burgers and hot dogs. He looked like he had just come out of the lake. The water's not too cold, is it? Cam asked. Why don't you find out? I asked. I raced past her and dove into the clear blue lake. It was surprisingly warm, but figured it was just heated up by the sun. I re-emerged and climbed back onto the deck. It's fine, I informed her, hungrily taking a plate from my brother. We soaked up the sun and enjoyed the lake, stopping to play a few rounds of badminton before the sun had started to set. We changed into something drier and went out to enjoy a nice steak dinner by the fire pit. Before we began to eat, Cam raised a glass. Frankie, thanks for having us here she said. Congrats on your good fortune. It couldn't have happened to someone more deserving. I raised my glass half hazard, wanting to dig into the stake as quickly as possible. Amelia and Kyle did the same as we had toasted my brother, who merely laughed us off. It's our good fortune, he clarified. We deserve it. We finally began to dig in and eat. Thankfully, the lodge had these large outdoor lights that managed to illuminate everything up to the border of the woods, so having dinner outside wasn't as creepy as it might have sounded. We sat around the picnic table and laughed for hours, but I could tell Amelia was still a bit creeped out by the woods. Doesn't it get lonely up here? She asked Frankie. 
He merely shakes his head. I never feel alone up here, he says in a creepy voice. The reaction from Amelia gets a laugh out of Cam and I. We stayed up for a few more hours and by 1am, Cam, Kyle, and Amelia had all gone to bed. I sat around and talked with Frankie for a bit longer, enjoying the fire pit and the dark allure of the woods. He got up to put the fire out, but I wasn't exactly ready to go to bed. Say, did you bring your Xbox up here? I asked. We could play something for a bit. Frankie sighed and put out the fire in the pit. Maybe tomorrow, he replied. I gotta finish some work down in the office. He gets up and pats me on the shoulder. Good night. Night, I call back to him as he walked into the lodge. I take this time alone to partake in the small stash of pots I had locked in the car. Though not illegal, I know my brother hates the smell, and I wanted to respect his property. I lit up a small joint and took a stroll around the property until I felt appropriately baked, at which point I buried the joint, popped a stick of gum in my mouth, sprayed on some cheap body spray, and went back inside. My initial intention was to head to bed, but the munchies got the better of me. As I rummaged through my brother's refrigerator, Hoping that there was some leftover burgers stashed somewhere, a sound caught my attention. I followed what appeared to be crying down the hall and towards the door to my brother's office, which was now slightly ajar. I called out to him, Frankie, but I got no response. Perhaps it was impaired judgment. Maybe it was my brotherly instinct to make sure Frankie was okay. Or maybe it was just plain old curiosity that led me to open the door to the basement steps that first night. The stairway had a small light bulb hanging above it. Frankie? I called out. But instead of my brother's voice, I just heard more crying. I slowly descended the steps and realized the staircase opened to a large space, similar to the one upstairs. There was a desk and a lot of cardboard boxes. But there was also this large oak door that was slightly ajar. I walked past the desk and boxes and began to slowly open the door. The room behind the oak door was practically bare. The only exception was an old ratty mattress that sat on a metal bed frame. The light from the room was poor at first, but it seemed like someone was huddled on the bed. As I began to walk further in, a woman's shape became clearer. She was young, probably about 19 if I had to guess, with long black hair. She was huddled in the fetal position wearing nothing but a small torn shirt and a pair of underwear. Her ankles were tightly taped together, and her wrists were similarly taped behind her back. I took a step closer, making a small sound that alerted her. She shot up immediately. I remember the look of fear in her bright blue eyes, which were red and slightly puffy. Tape had been tightly wrapped around her mouth so tightly that I could see where it had begun to imprint into her skin. The look of fear changed when she had saw me and then she began to plead with me, but I couldn't understand her. I looked long and hard at her, noticing how dirty she looked. She also looked scraped and bruised as if she was running through the brush outside. I took a step closer, almost hypnotized by her as she continued to try and say something to me. I began to slowly question reality, wondering if this was real or if I had just gotten a bad batch of pot, until my brother's voice snapped me back to reality. Jacob! I felt his hand grab my shoulder and yank me back through the oak door. Frankie then quickly closed and locked it as I stumbled backwards in the open space. What did I tell you about coming down here? He asked. I... I... I stammered. He had caught me completely off guard. I had never seen my brother with such anger in his eyes. I heard something and just wanted to see if you were alright. I finally spat out. Who... My brother put up his hand to stop me. He took a deep breath and walked over to the nearby desk. He took a seat and exhaled. She's... a woman I'm seeing. He told me. I gave him a look of confusion. What are you talking about? 
I asked. Look, truthfully, I've been seeing her for a few months. Her name is Claire and she has a... He paused and looked uncomfortable with what he was about to say. She has a, let's say, damsel in distress type of fetish. This was probably the first time I had regretted smoking so much. So this is... Roleplay. Frankie interrupted with an awkward chuckle. And it was at this time I finally noticed that he had been holding a revolver. But it wasn't his service weapon. It was something a lot newer. Embarrassing, I know. Definitely not something I wanted my little brother to see. I let out a sigh of relief. Of course, Frankie had a reasonable explanation. I mean, why would he lie? I thought. He placed the revolver on the desk and led me back upstairs. I was planning for everyone to meet her tomorrow, but she's a bit shy, so we should keep this between us for now. He insisted. I don't know why, but the way Frankie spit out the sentence, it came off weird to me. Of course, I told him. I look forward to it. He pat me on the back as I re-entered the dark hallway. I could feel his eyes on me as I stumbled up the steps. As soon as I hit the last one, I heard the basement door creak shut. I climbed into bed with Amelia and passed out. I woke up surprisingly early the next morning. When I checked the time on my phone, it was only 7 a.m. I had looked next to me, and Amelia was still fast asleep. So I slipped downstairs, hoping to sneak a meal from the fridge before breakfast. But as I got closer to the bottom, I began to smell coffee and bacon. I walked into the kitchen to see my brother already cooking breakfast. Good morning, he greeted me. The kitchen table was lined up with waffles, eggs, bacon, sausage, coffee. The man even made cinnamon rolls. He looked tired, like he hadn't slept long. I figured he must have woken up early to prepare this magnificent feast. Help yourself, he told me. I grabbed a plate and began to dig in. Will your princess be joining us? I asked trying my best to make light of the uncomfortable situation I put my brother in. There was an emergency, Frankie blurted out. With work, unfortunately she couldn't stay. He grabs a plate of his own and joins me, but she wanted to profusely apologize for last night. She was... I waved him off. That was my bad, I told him. Won't happen again. My brother mumbled a response and dug into his breakfast, and the way he just easily dismissed it didn't sit right with me. In fact, Frankie's demeanor didn't change at all throughout the day. I had figured there'd be at least some aura of embarrassment, but nothing. And after I got about four cinnamon rolls in, I realized something. Frankie's car was the only other one here aside from mine and Cam's. So how did Claire end up leaving? We spent the day outside again. More lakeside fun and barbecue food. But I just couldn't shake off this feeling I had ever since my encounter with Frankie at breakfast. I began to get more paranoid once I saw the shed. I went in there to grab some fire starters when I noticed his shovel. It wouldn't seem so out of place, but it looked like it had just been used. So, when Frankie decided to turn in early that night, I decided I had to get a better, sober look in that basement, if for no other reason than to simply put myself at ease. I waited for everyone to fall asleep before sneaking down the steps of the lodge. I used the chirping of the crickets as a safety blanket of sorts to assure me I wasn't alone. I made it to the basement door and tried it, hoping it would be unlocked, but no luck. I went to the front door and grabbed Frankie's keys that hung on a hook by the door. I tried every key on that hook with no luck until finally, I heard a click. I slipped into the basement, carrying the keys with me, and slowly descended the stairs. I took a look at Frankie's desk and noticed that there was nothing on it but an old box. I took a quick look inside to find various items inside, individual Ziploc bags. I pulled out one bag that contained an old metal ring. 
It was shaped like a skull and looked cheap and gaudy. Written on it in Sharpie was a name, Marcus Jackson. It took me a while, but I remember where I had heard it before. Marcus Jackson was a tattoo artist who set up close to town. One day they found him murdered in the back of a local deli. Frankie had been the one to find his bloody wallet in Marcus' girlfriend's car. Though she swore up and down that she was innocent, the evidence was too much to deny, and she was sentenced to life. I began looking through the box. All of them contained an item from a case that Frankie had solved. The next bag I pulled out contained a lipstick tube of Maria Williams. She was a bartender. Pretty girl, who'd often get flirted with by the waves of drunken customers. They found her beaten to death and assaulted in her car. Frankie had found her discarded bra in Josh Schultz's trailer as if he had taken it for a trophy. Josh was the town's drunk, and though he swore he didn't do it, he couldn't account for his whereabouts due to him blacking out. Every bag contained something from one of those cases. I back away in horror and collide with the yoke door. I rip it open and examine the room with fresh eyes. The first thing I noticed was a folding table off to my left. I creep up onto the table to find more Ziploc bags, but there was more of them here than in the box on his desk. There had to be about 20 of them. Each one contained the driver's license of a young woman and a pair of underwear. I recognized each one's town as being very close to our small town. One of the names even looked very familiar, Maria Williams. There was one pair that had been left out of the bag and it looked strangely familiar. I walked over to the end of the table to find this particular pair of underwear accompanied by the license of one, Claire Thompson. I turned to look at the ratty bed, and for the first time, saw how old and worn it was. There was cuffs dangling from the old metal bars of the bed frame. A collar was laid on the bed attached to a chain that I followed to a metal plate mounted on the wall but one spot on the frame looked altered. It seemed like there was a metal clip welded onto the frame, and surprisingly enough, it had matched the clip that connected the collar on the bed to the chain attached to the wall. I looked up and finally noticed it. I don't know how I could have missed it. In front of the bed was a standing mirror, and plastered on that mirror was a sticker, an old white sticker that was about the size of a bookmark. The same sticker that had an old school yellow smiley face on it. The same one that read, Smile, you have your whole life ahead of you. Lucy's decision to become a funeral director was born from two things. The first was the disgust at how extortionate the funeral business has become, secretive and dominated by men who pushed traditional beliefs of expensive and unnecessary funerals. The second was seeing what it truly lacked, personal touch, the bare minimum for anyone's final send-off. She'd worked in marketing earlier in life, seeing firsthand how people were repeatedly conned into buying things that Really, they didn't need. This was an inherent part of the business world, but seeing the same thievery in the funeral business was unacceptable. To profit so overtly in someone's death. She put her heart and soul into every single family bereavement who came to her. Lucy worked tirelessly, even when she was called out to retrieve a body in the early hours. She never relented. And so on the day she was roused from sleep at 4.10 a.m. by the insistent humming of her phone on the bedside table, she acquiesced to the calling and picked up. No one spoke from the other end. Lucy yawned, then took it upon herself. Hi, who is it? With the speaker pressed to her ear, she could only make out hushed but somewhat frantic breathing before a man's voice sounded. Yes, hello? 
Uh, this is Velvet Shroud Funerals. Hey, yeah, Lucy speaking. What can I do for you? There's a, um, a body here that needs picking up. St. Alfred's Church at Finch's Green. Okay, I'll be there as soon as I can. I should warn you, Lucy. It's a young boy. The man interjected, his voice becoming shaky. Lucy had been on many body retrievals, but the clients in question were usually middle to old aged. She seldom had to deal with the young, and always felt a vague foreboding on these occasions. But no matter the age, all are deserving of the proper treatment. Ah, thanks for letting me know. I'll drive out to you now. She threw off the bed sheets, letting the wintry air in the room wash over her skin, drawing out goose flesh. After dressing in a white shirt, dark trousers, and her black overcoat, she made her way down the stairs and out to her van. Setting the destination on the sat-nav, she started the ignition and pulled out onto the road, driving down the country roads that seemed frozen in time by the cold night. Well, many things fall from familiarity in the darkness, Lucy could swear she'd never seen before the roads she found herself on. Even after living in the area for ten years, to her, these coiling lanes hadn't existed until this very moment. The old metal signs of the small village sped out from the darkness like a fish from the depths passed by, and was swallowed up just as quickly as it emerged. The paint was peeling and faded, but the few letters read Finch's Green. The air held a silent apprehension as she stepped out of the van, beholding the moonlit silhouette of an archaic Norman church. Its shallowed steeple rose into the air, pointing an accusation of the heavens above. Lucy winced as the quiet was broken by the snapping of the gurney clips freeing it from the van's interior and allowing it to trundle out, a single wheel squeaking with each revolution. With the trolley raised to waist height, she shut her van, locked it, and began up the old, cobbled path. It was an uncanny night. Besides the razor-edged crescent moon, the sky was empty. Not a pinprick of light to indicate a star unveiled itself from above. A light mist held close to the ground, making decrepit boats of gravestones, clipped bows, and ruined sterns jutting out from a spectral sea. Lucy couldn't muster the will to resist the unease that swept across this holy ground, as if its presence was an inherent, undeniable truth. So self-absorbed she was in this feeling that she hadn't yet noticed the huddled figures, just barely outlined by the pale moonlight afront the vestibule. She needn't search for them, as one of them, a man, made their presence known. Are you here for our son? His voice was wrought and subdued agony, like rattling fine china on the verge of cracking. Lucy slowed her pace, making the cobblestone imperfections below manifest themselves through the gurney. Yes, um, I'm Lucy from Velvet Shroud Funerals. I was called out here by... He's inside. Please hurry. The man shuddered, directing his attention back to the woman he held in his arms, who shook and sobbed openly. Deciding not to question his peculiar urgency... Lucy unlatched the time-worn oaken door to the vestibule. Within, another shape took form out of the darkness, darting in her direction. She flinched, then lowered her hand to see the vicar who had been waiting in the porch. Thank the Lord you're here. I must be going now. Thank you for your kindness. Before Lucy could get a word in, the vicar slid past her and quickly disappeared into the moonlit, starless night. Inside the chapel, the only light was filtered through the sparse, stained glass windows, scattering a multitude of fractured colors across the maroon tiles and dark wood pews. Dust floated aimlessly in the beams of light, 
only to become hidden in the darkness once more. At the far end of the center aisle, something was illuminated by a beam of red light, moonlight passing through the blood of Christ, impaled by the spear of Longinus. An adult-sized figure lay under a white sheet. This couldn't be their son, Lucy thought. She'd gotten the impression of a young boy, no less than ten, but the shape concealed under the veil was of no child. Then again, who she'd thought to be the parents outside had never specified an age. She let her arms flop down to her sides in exasperation. This was going to be a hefty load. She dialed her colleague, hoping to call him out for assistance. No luck. It seemed like she had reception, but the call just kept going straight to the busy tone. Reluctantly, Lucy released the gurney jacks and lowered it to the floor level, snapping on tight a pair of latex gloves. She squatted, bracing her back, and pulled at the ankles. She stumbled backward, letting go of the body after finding that, for its size, it was impossibly light. Not like a plastic mannequin but with the resistance of a child's limp body. The body slid onto the stretcher without any trouble, and Lucy once again pumped at the jacks. She hesitated for a moment. There was a feeling. A magnetic pull toward the body under the blanket. She found her hand drifting toward the head, intent on pulling back the sheet, before catching it and pulling away. A heavy foreboding seemed to be contained under the thin layer of fabric, and if she were to shift it away, some untold terror would be unleashed. Relenting, Lucy turned the trolley around in the aisle and made her way back toward the entrance. She still felt the presence of her god, guiding her even in the darkest of nights. But there was something else, too. Something she didn't stay long enough to discern. A wave of anguished wailing erupted from the woman outside as the gurney wheezed past. The man looked down to the body, then up to Lucy, the sense of loss palpable in his eyes. Even holding his gaze for just a moment caused a chill to race down her spine. She gave them the address of her shop, and they made off without another word. Only mumbles of reassurance amongst sorrowful cries. In the void where two people had just been seen, a thick silence took residence. That followed Lucy as she pushed the trolley back down the cobbled path. The stretcher loaded into the van with ease, and was secured in moments. Despite the apparent cell reception, the sat-nav presented her route as a lone, ragged blue line that bent and curved the route home. The dark lanes coiling ahead of the van were just as, if not, unrecognizable than they had been on the initial journey. Perhaps the sat-nav had just chosen another way back. It didn't matter. Something shifted in the back, unknown to Lucy. Was that a stifled cough? Maybe a sniffle? That came from somewhere behind her. She wasn't even certain if there had been any sound at all. She kept her eyes locked on the road, out of sight, out of mind. Lucy didn't know when it happened, but she found herself finally driving down a road she knew. In tandem, the sat-nav blinked with buffering satellite imagery. Even though there had been reception for most of the night. Not ten minutes later, Lucy's van pulled up into the rear entrance to the shop. She sat with her eyes closed for a brief moment after turning off the vehicle. The events had left her a little shaken, but the feeling bled away as she acknowledged her exhaustion. Everything was normal. She only needed a warm coffee to wake up. The town wasn't silent, and the gurney clips shattered no unbroken calm. Distant noises of cars drifted along the sky as Lucy pulled the stretcher out pumped the jacks and made her way up the slight ramp to the mortuary. Entering the freezer room, she winced at the cold blast of air, but the jolt woke her up some, sharpening her mind. The racks were empty. 
always aspiring to be neat as possible, Lucy slid the stretcher off the trolley and onto the lowermost rack. Empty spaces below a body didn't sit right with her. The reasons she could never pin down the stretcher, bearing the impression of a corpse beneath linen, slid back into the shelves and clicked into place, leaving the gurney empty. Lucy returned it back to her van, then came around to the front entrance, opening the shop's doors for the day. At long last, the kettle squealed, heralding the hot brew of coffee Lucy needed since the moment she woke. The steam drifted from her mug into the winter air as she walked down the old, beaten path behind the shop, down to her favorite spot by the lake. A lone bench overlooked the watery expanse, still glittering with stars from the fading night. Lucy sat, cradling her mug, looking out to cross the water. It was, really, a form of meditation that, for her at least, required no effort. Being a familiar sight, Lucy didn't yet notice the sky's stark contrast in comparison to earlier. Yes, cloud cover may have come and gone smothering the stars and releasing them later, but the moon still hung back in Finch's green clear as day. Here, both the pale crescent and the starry expanse were visible. Before she could understand any of it, the sun began its climb, slowly heaving itself above the horizon. Finishing her coffee, Lucy stood up from the bench, stretched out, and made her way back to the funeral director's. After starting up her work laptop, the rising urge for another coffee pushed itself into her mind. The urge was quickly sated, though. When her colleague Dan arrived with fresh coffee and whole meal blueberry muffins. Hey, Luce. If you've already had breakfast, well, make some room. Morning, Dan. Is this muffin thing turning into a tradition? You know I can't resist the bakery when I drive past. Maybe I should take a different route in the mornings, but they're just so good. He chuckled. Dan set down the to-go breakfast and sat down across from Lucy, pulling out a folder from his bag. Thanks, Lucy said. I've just picked another one up today. A little boy. Dan released a sigh at this. Even for those accustomed to death, and the morbid in general, dead children were something that could only be prepared for. There was no getting used to it. Yeah, he's not really little at all, though. I tried calling you earlier, thought I might need some help, but it didn't end up being too difficult. Was your phone off? You phoned me? I've had it plugged in all night, and you know I'm never on Do Not Disturb. Same reasons as you. Dan unlocked his phone and navigated to the contacts app. He scanned the missed calls for a moment before looking up at Lucy. Nope, nothing. Weird. Well, it doesn't matter. He's here now. Lucy rose up from her seat, turning slightly while beckoning Dan to follow. The pair entered the freezer room. Even with a now wakeful head, Lucy felt that dark apprehension just as she had back in the church. Dan made his way over to the racks and pulled the only occupied one halfway out. He gently uncovered the body, pulling the white linen away from the head. Lucy's legs almost gave out when she saw what lay underneath. This was not a little boy. It wasn't even human. The head was a coiled mess of twisted, ribbed horns curled tightly to form a round and solid mass, only broken by a central hole where a face might be, a window into a black abyss. Chitinous patches covered the skin on its chest and shoulders, framed by visceral purple skin, stretched taut across sharp bone. Bulging veins branched across the surface, but their color, their vitality, belonged to a living body, not a corpse. The intense focus Lucy held on the creature dulled her other senses, 
deafening her to Dan's worried calls. Luce, Luce, are you okay? Everything came back sharply. Her shallow breaths, the pounding of blood in her temples. Y you don't... It's... I know, I know. He can't be more than seven or eight. I get that it's more difficult for you with children of your own. Dan turned around without waiting for a response and covered the abomination back over. Come back through. I need to be filled in on your info. He walked out of sight into the reception area, leaving Lucy to absorb the newfound horror she had just witnessed. Did he not see what I just saw? She thought, slack-jawed, feeling somewhere between shock and puzzlement. As much as she wanted to check her eyes hadn't deceived her, Lucy couldn't bring herself to lift the sheet. Even with her fingers grasped onto the rim, it was as if the sheet were made of titanium. Are you of faith? Lucy stepped back from the racks and spun around looking for Dan. It was an odd question, but he was the only other person in the shop. No one. He wasn't there. Lucy didn't have time to think about her next action before the question rang out again from every conceivable direction. Are you of faith? Trembling, she turned her head ever so slowly, peering out of the corner of her eye toward the shelved body, before looking at it directly. She didn't know what she was expecting, but the corpse lay still as ever, unmoving, silent, her unnerving trance relented, and she was quick to pace over the cold room's door, exiting and closing it. Lucy took a moment to still her racing thoughts. That couldn't have actually happened, right? She was just tired. Yes, that was it. Just tired. She'd had a bit of a late night, so it was a reasonable conclusion. She and Dan discussed the details of the case. The parents had only introduced themselves as Mr. and Mrs. Petra at the time, and their deceased son as Liam. In any case, the cause of death was as clear to Lucy as the next winning lottery ticket's number. So she rang her usual coroner to arrange an autopsy. An examination on the afternoon of the same day was agreed, but the Petras turned up just before midday. The daylight drew out their complexions. Mr. Petra's tanned skin and wind-worn crow's feet, contrasting Mrs. Petra's, fairer and paler but reddened face. Mr. Petra seemed in a half daze but shook himself into order to address Lucy. Hi there. We should have come earlier, but, well, I completely understand. This is a very difficult time for you, Lucy reassured him. Can she... can we see him? His wife looked up from the floor, floodgates already on the verge of bursting open. She looked over to him, then to Lucy. The emotion in her eyes took a second for Lucy to fully comprehend. A despair beyond despair. Too stunned initially to reply, Dan stepped in and gestured for the couple to follow. Not a word spoken. Lucy sat at her desk outside, already planning the basic arrangements for Liam's funeral. Halfway through typing a word, her hand jolted sideways and broke off a keycap in response to the mother's abrupt wail. Mr. Petra emerged from the cold room barely supporting his own flimsy stoicism, let alone the sobbing and weak-kneed Mrs. Petra who clung to his shoulder. Standing now, Lucy rested a gentle hand on Mrs. Petra's back. It's okay if you want to come back another day. To go through our options, any break you want is time you need. The mother's spasms and sobs calmed just a bit, and she drew in a few deep sniffles to clear her nose. That's... I... thanks. I just... I just never imagined our time with him would be so short. Her words were cut off by an involuntary hick, but she caught herself from breaking down again. Mr. Petra spoke up in her place. I think we should talk about plans now. If you're not booked up... 
his wife nodded in agreement. Lucy reciprocated, opening the meeting room door and leading them inside. Most, if not all, of the suggestions came from Lucy, the parents being too distraught to trust themselves to think clearly. Though, in particular, they insisted the funeral be modest and discreet. Lucy understood this. The commonly used proverb of we are not here to mourn their passing, but to celebrate their life, did not apply so well when the deceased in question had barely gotten a glimpse of their own. No disagreements were had, but it may have simply been that the parents were already anxious to leave the same building housing their dead child. They had informed Lucy of a medical condition the boy had involving high blood pressure. This was passed to the coroner, when the body was sent off for the post-mortem. It turned out to be a great help, as the coroner was finished by late afternoon on the same day. It was found that the boy suffered from a major aneurysm, which was recorded as the official cause of death. However, Lucy found no closure in knowing this. When she brought the body into the embalming room, a voice once again pierced the veil. It was different this time, not the weak and raspy one that spoke to her before, but youthful and choked up. It's so dark. Where's my mom and dad? Please, let me out. Lucy could only listen, as her limbs became stiff as the corpse beneath her. The pleading was answered for her. Don't worry, boy. We're in this together, and it won't be long now. Lucy here will see to that. For the first time, her lips parted an inquire on this madness. Who is that? We're right in front of you. The raspy voice shot back. Lucy took a step back in impossible realization. We mean you no harm. He's only a child after all. If you would just lay us to rest, he can be freed. The utterance was followed by quiet, ethereal sobs. The voices sent Lucy no comfort, for how could this be? She was close to fainting when the familiar voice of her colleague brought her back from her stupor. You want me to do this, Luce? I'm not going to judge you or anything. That? Yes, please. That would be for the best, I think. While Dan took care of the embalming, Lucy did the admin planning costs and services for the funeral. It was to be held at the start of the next week. As planned, the funeral was nothing special, nor was it in celebration or reminiscence. Lucy and the attendees were held under a blanket of silence, except the parents. This time, Mr. Petra joined his wife in her expression of grief, matching her despair. He'd been bottling up his true feelings until this moment, feeling like he would fail his lost child in doing so before the ceremony. In accordance with their hopelessness, the parents had wished for a closed casket, outdoor funeral. Lucy tried to push the feeling away, but it brought her some relief knowing she wouldn't have to see that monstrosity invisible to all but her. After the vicar spoke the final vows, the casket was lowered and it was done. Short and anything but sweet. Mr. and Mrs. Petra thanked Lucy for her compassion, then left quietly. Lucy returned to her shop for the day. Thankfully, it was finally over, despite the entire process being relatively short in comparison with previous cases. Still, there was a lingering stress so she went out the back to do what she always did, when in need of some peace, however brief. The familiar feeling of worries being washed away came over her, as she sat looking out across the lake. She'd been stressing before, that the boy wasn't commemorated as he deserved, but respected the decision of his parents more than anything. It was during her contemplation when a different feeling came over her, something entirely unfamiliar. She recalled how she'd felt after hearing those disembodied voices. Still unable to move, only now it was all encompassing. 
Through some unknown influence, her entire body became rigid, tensed in apprehension of something. That something introduced itself as distant, echoing steps, sounding from down the path to her right. They sounded wrong, like they reverberated about a large cathedral instead of the open air. A cold sweat broke out on Lucy's forehead as the footsteps grew closer, agonizingly slow, though they were already audible. Only when they grew closer could the sound of crunching leaves beneath hefty feet be heard. An involuntary whimper grew from Lucy's throat as she felt the wood of the bench creak beside her, as if something large had taken a seat and settled quietly. For a moment, the only sound was her shallow, shaky breaths. You are of faith, aren't you? Of faith so steadfast that the barriers in your perception have fallen away, unlike most. The same gravelly voice was addressing her now. She only hoped that whatever was holding her in place would not let go, in fear of turning to see the being. Do not fret. I am here to show my thanks. Nothing more. You put the poor boy's soul at peace, and he has left his flesh in search of the beyond. Something else came and forced me out of my prison. Its wistful rambling was too much to withstand in any case. I owe you some form of explanation, I think. His very soul was in the process of being twisted, cultivated by the hands of the legion who had taken residence within him. I salute the Prius efforts, of course, but he could not follow through. The boy's death during exorcism means that I am something halfway. Though its voice sounded torn and shredded, it strangely comforted Lucy's trembling form. Even if the blood was drained from her face, I harbor no ill will, nor do I have visions of benevolence. I know not of hellfire and brimstone, but as it is for my creators, it is the realm of my belonging, and so I must return. Thank you. That is all. With that, the pressure that emanated from the air itself dissipated, and with the soft creaking of wood being relieved, Lucy's visitor departed. She didn't know how to feel, as her limbs were freed from stasis. A demon? No. A demon could never speak so neutrally. She turned to look, to call after it with the questions that piled in her mind, but it was gone. Whatever it was, she felt an unexpected satisfaction from its visit. Closure. However unimaginable the circumstances, she stood and began the slow walk back. Her faith was strengthened with a compassion for something she didn't know existed. Living underneath a star-filled sky that might never falter again. With the housing market ripping the skin off everyone under 30, I finally found a decent house that fit my budget after years of searching and researching. I thought I would live on rent forever. I paid a good down payment with money saved since I was 18. I would pay the rest in the next 20 years. With monthly payments well below the price I would pay for a rental, due to the high down payment. The nice house sealed my last financial goal in life. Now the only thing left was to find a nice girl, get married, and have children closing my ephemeral life with everything a person could want. The house was located near the company where I worked, no longer needing to take the bus for half an hour to get there, and half an hour to get home was fantastic. The first week was uncomfortable. It's difficult to adapt to a new place. The neighbors made noise the whole night, not very loud, but my brain couldn't shut off with that new ambient sound so I woke up constantly. In the second week, I think my body got used to the constant noises. After all, I started sleeping like a baby. 
without waking up in the middle of the night not even once. The house still had some things from its previous owners. In the room, a painting of a lady in Victorian clothes stood out. After finishing organizing my new house, I removed the artwork and stored it in a back room, planning to sell it later. The next morning, my weird nightmares began. The painting I had stored in the back room was hanging on the wall again. Had I dreamed that I had taken the painting off the wall, there was no sign of a break-in in my house, nothing was missing, and no one would come in just to redecorate my living room. Weird. I removed the painting, placing it again in the unoccupied back room. The next day, when I woke up, I walked through the living room to go to the bathroom. An uneasiness dominated my entire existence when I realized that the painting of the Victorian lady was on the wall again. Was someone really breaking into my house? Or was I a sleepwalker redecorating the house at dawn? What was going on? This time, I hid the painting in a locked closet before going to bed. When I woke up, to my horror, I saw the painting on the wall again, having even overcome a lock. Feeling helpless with the bizarre situation, I left the painting on the living room wall and called my best friend William to have a beer and hang out at my house. I told him about the strange situation, the painting returning to the wall while I was sleeping. William advised me to place cameras at the entrances to my house, stressing how dangerous the situation was. Someone breaking in while I was asleep sounded completely insane. With me vulnerable while asleep, the invader could even kill me. With my eyes opened by William's speech, that night I left the computer camera in my room on, pointed to my bed. This way, I would know if the intruder was just breaking into the house, or if he was doing something to me too. But I don't know. I think if someone opened my bedroom door, I would wake up immediately. The next day, the first thing I did when I woke up was go to the computer to check the recording. The footage started with me adjusting the camera and going to bed, and then rolling around a little trying to fall asleep. About half an hour later, I could hear the sound recording my bedroom door opening and footsteps approaching the camera, taking advantage of a blind spot. The invader went to the camera undetected and turned it towards the wall. Then the footsteps didn't go outside the room. Instead, I heard my bed crunching, as if the intruder had laid down next to me. Then, a female voice began to sing a lullaby, stopping after a few minutes. After that, complete silence. Analyzing the soundtrack of the recording, I fast forward when there was no sound. Just before my alarm time, I could hear the bed creaking, footsteps around the room, and the door opening and closing. Even though I didn't see any images, I had no doubts. Someone completely insane was lying in my bed and sleeping next to me. After seeing, listening in this case, to the bizarre recordings, I didn't go to work. I really was in danger. Instead, I went to a store to buy cameras and install them in the house. I also changed all the locks. I put a camera at the front gate, front door, and back door. Taking advantage of the fact that I could now identify the intruder, I removed the painting from the wall again. After all, I was already sure that it wasn't me walking around in my sleep. There was a second person wandering around my house at night. The next day, even after all the locks had been changed, the painting was back on the wall. I checked the images from the cameras, which didn't identify anything. Whoever was breaking into my house was using a secret passage, and they weren't even trying to stay hidden, after all. Why put the picture up on the wall again every night? Had the person broken into my room, even though it was locked and laid down with me again? I decided to change the position of the cameras. I placed two in my room, one by the window and one by the door, both covering almost my whole room, and the third in the living room pointing at the painting. 
Whoever was invading had some affection for that artwork. The next morning, I went to check the recordings. This time, I managed to capture what was happening. Even knowing how everything that had happened in recent days was bordering on impossible, I still could hardly believe my eyes when I looked at the footage. The painting, if I can still call it that, transformed into a woman dressed in Victorian attire. At first glance, it was a normal person, but as soon as the girl set her feet on the ground, she identified the camera and approached it. The unblinking eyes were larger than normal, black as pearls. The mouth, when facing the camera, opened a smile, almost like a got me expression. The sympathetically opened mouth had another detail that made it clear that I wasn't dealing with something human. Pointy teeth decorated the opening, and instead of there being a tongue, and instead of there being a tongue, all I saw was an infinite pitch, as if there were a black hole inside that being, and the human skin of a refined and attractive woman was a hollow shell that housed another universe within itself. The lips sealed and only a faint smile remained, facing the camera with those two disproportionately gigantic irises. The woman then walked out of the camera's view. I switched to the bedroom camera, which recorded the same woman opening the door and entering. This time, she decided to let me watch. She didn't turn the camera away from the bed. Maintaining eye contact with the lens that recorded her, she undressed, taking minutes due to the complexity of the archaic clothes she wore. Then, completely naked, the woman lay down by my side, spooning me. A scene that would seem normal in a bed of a married couple. Got a grotesque detail seconds later. The woman opened her mouth in an impossible way, revealing the blackest, endless hole I had ever witnessed living inside her body. Her face, previously delicate and perfectly symmetrical, if it weren't for her unusually large eyes, practically became the opening of her mouth, as if her eyes and nose had ended up on the back of her head. The grotesque opening of the mouth, having already completely replaced her face, then bit into the area of my skull, swallowing half of my head. I put my hand in my hair, the back of my neck and forehead immediately after watching that scene, looking for teeth marks, saliva, any signs that there had been a mouth swallowing half my head the night before. Nothing. If I hadn't been looking at the recordings right now, it would be as if the event hadn't happened. There was no after effect or sign. I watched the recording until the end, accelerating the recording speed. The woman spent a few hours with her huge mouth swallowing half of my head and, a few minutes before I woke up, her mouth shrank, to returning to normal and stopping to suck the area of my brain. She then got up, put on her complex Victorian costume and returned to the living room, transforming herself into the painting again. In a gesture so quick that even with me pausing the frames of the filming, I couldn't follow the metamorphosis. I didn't even need to describe how terrified I was by this. I missed work again that day claiming I was feeling unwell. Aiming to find solutions, I started with the most obvious, destroying the painting. I tried throwing it away, burning it, hacking it, locking it up, nothing worked. The painting thrown into the river miles from my city returned to my living room wall. The fire and axes didn't even scratch the artwork. The locks of the places where I locked it were opened easily, as if the woman didn't need keys and could mentally order the locks to open. I tried to stay awake all night, hoping to confront that being, but the woman didn't come. It seems like she knew exactly when I fell asleep. After waking up, already in the afternoon, 
I watched on the recordings the woman performing the same bizarre gesture of swallowing half of my head and remaining like that until minutes before I woke up. Having not found permanent solutions, I tried a temporary one. I slept in my parents' apartment for a few days, claiming I needed to pest control my house after an insect infestation. My boss discounted the consecutive days I was absent. I was almost fired. My expenses increased, having to pay for transports again, and the money spent on cameras exceeded my budget for the month. But a week later, I had to go back to that cursed house. What could I do? I had already cut expenses to be able to pay the monthly installment on the house. There were still 20 years of payments left. Even if I tried to sell the house, it would take a lot of time to find a buyer, and I would probably lose money too. When I returned home, there was a message on the door in red. Don't run away. I won't hurt you. Sleep with me. Whatever this creature is, it has consciousness and can talk to me. What does it use to write the messages? Blood? I ran my finger through it and after finding the texture familiar, I deciphered that it was just ketchup. The monster had opened the refrigerator and used the condiment to send the message to me. So, I thought of one last solution. If it was impossible for me to confront the monster while I was awake, since he was waiting for me to fall asleep, maybe William could help me. After all, I called the police, they would call me crazy. Hey, I need a favor. Can you help me? I sent the message to him. Following my request, he came at night. I explained that there was indeed an invader, but I softened it by saying that it was a crazy unarmed woman. I asked him to confront the intruder, asking her what she wants and telling her to stop invading. I told him that somehow, she knew exactly if I was asleep and only invaded afterwards, which is why I needed him to confront the crazy woman. I didn't show the recordings, saying I had already deleted them. I thought that the lady in the painting was harmless, that since she hadn't hurt me, she wouldn't do anything to William. My reasoning was stupid. I positioned the cameras, and with the guarantee that someone would be awake watching me, I fell asleep. When I woke up, there was no sign of William. What a traitor, I thought, thinking that he had succumbed to boredom and went home, giving up on helping me. However, when I watched the recordings, I visualized the grotesque scene that will burn in my mind forever. The images showed my friend sitting at the computer and the woman of the painting entering the room, William looking at the Victorian figure confused. Without any dialogue, the woman opened her mouth in a colossal way and swallowed my friend in seconds, without chewing, as if he were a snake. The piercing, desperate screams heard on the recording not waking me up made it clear. I would never be able to wake up while the woman was walking around the house. She somehow kept me in a constant sleep. The piercing howls of despair lasted only a few seconds. Within moments, William had been completely consumed by the woman, who after the merciless murder, once again undressed and lay down beside me, resting her impossibly open mouth on the area of my skull. Having exhausted all possible options, I went to the painting in a last desperate act. What do you want? Why don't you leave me alone? Why don't you kill me once and for all? Why did you kill my friend? To my surprise, for the first time since the bizarre event began, the woman's face jumped out of the frame moving her lips while leaving her pointy teeth and the endless hole living in her mouth exposed with each movement. It's a shame for your friend, but I couldn't take any more of your attempts to get rid of me. I needed to show what I'm capable of. Why? If you're so powerful, why don't you go to another house? Why do you sleep next to me? 
I'm not sleeping next to you. I'm consuming your dreams. Sweet chaos of the mind organizing itself. Delicious random scenes, but which reveal so much from your essence. I will not comment on my choices and what I can do, but I promise you, as long as you don't try to get rid of me anymore, I won't hurt you or anyone you love. I also want you to stop filming and delete the recordings. I like my privacy. The face retracted and became a painting again. I tried to ask a few more questions, but none were answered. The entity had said everything it wanted. I obeyed. I deleted the recordings and didn't try to get rid of the painting anymore. The following week, police officers came to question me about William's disappearance. I told them that he went home that night. I think I'm clear. The cameras are already stored and they'll never find his body. That was months ago. I miss being able to dream. I don't know if it's the stress, but I feel like I've aged a few years in the last few months, and that my memory isn't the same anymore. I'm thinking about packing my bags and moving, giving up the down payment I gave up on the house. With the money from my salary, I can get a small apartment. But I'm afraid. Will the woman in the painting get mad? Can she follow me? Do something to me? Hurt my loved ones? I searched everywhere, describing the characteristics of the monster in angelic skin, but I couldn't find any answers. I don't know what will happen if I try to escape. So, as a last resort, I'm posting this here. Begging to everyone who reads this, if you have a solution, if you know what this entity is, please help me. What can I do?